just had a wonderful podcast with Superintendent Scott T. McHugh, and I, I met him recently. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was in the superintendent position, he was willing to learn. He is willing to grow. And one of the things that he said in the podcast as we were talking about this, that if I was like the same person 10 years ago that I am today, then that's probably not a good sign. And I think as leaders, as educators, one of the things I talk about quite a bit is do we embody the things that we expect from our students? And I don't know if you ever have done this in a professional learning session or, you know, there's these things called professional learning norms. It's like, hey, we got to respect each other's opinions, do this, do that. And there's like, you know, people list like three things. And I'm not a fan. And I, I, I just never been a fan. I don't know why. But there is a professional learning norm that I've always encouraged. And it's just one thing, one thing. It's all I expect from you today is to learn in a way that you expect from your students. And I know that sounds weird, but like, what do you expect from your students? What do you expect? And how do we model that? And at every single position within our schools, how do we model our own learning? How do we grow? How do we develop? How do we get better in the same way that we'd ask our students? And I, I kept thinking about that as I'm listening to Scott um, in this podcast. I know you're going to really enjoy it. And I really love connecting with him. And as he was talking, I, I, I challenged him that he needed to blog. He needed to share. And I give some tips on if you were to get started on a blog, what would that look like? How could you get started? And those tips I give to Scott, they can apply to anybody. So I hope you get some value of that. If you have a blog or you even write a comment of something you learned in this space, and I'm encouraging you to subscribe on YouTube. I'm encouraging you to write a comment. Here's what I do. Take something that you learned from this podcast today, write it in the comment, take the comment and have that be your first blog post if you've never done, or maybe have it be a podcast. Maybe go deeper onto it on Instagram or Twitter. Because I think when we take those little moments where we comment, can we expand? Can we go deeper into that? It's a great way to start putting your ideas in the world. And it's not for you to brag or anything. It's just to to make your learning visible. And Scott does a great job of that. And I hope um, me sharing these little intros with you is me kind of talking through what I just learned from the podcast. But either way, I know you're going to benefit from listening to Scott. I hope you have a, a, a wonderful day. And thanks, thanks for being here. Another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Crows. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have Superintendent Scott T. McHugh from Eatontown Public Schools. In, uh, and I'm just saying this because I've been practicing Monmouth, Monmouth County, right? You're hitting another home run. I'm just like, I'm just like nailing Monmouth County. So we just actually, uh, Scott and I just did a podcast uh, talking about the three questions, I, I usually split this up in two. And Scott was just telling me this is his first podcast ever, and he crushed that one. So big expectations, man! Like this is uh, this I consider this podcast number two. You're like you're you're moving to professional now. You that was amateur stuff, and you're crushing it. So I'm, it, I'm seasoned and experienced now, huh? <laughs> yeah. So Scott and I connected uh, recently. I, I worked with him and a, a superintendent group um, in, in Monmouth County, uh, and it was absolutely wonderful and met some really incredible leaders uh and scott is actually a superintendent right now in, in a school district uh and i'm gonna ask you we're gonna talk about this in a second you're also a runner i'm gonna ask you some questions about running too because i think there's a lot of leadership lessons that we can take from running i'm sure i know that's something you're excited about but scott if you can just kind of introduce yourself who you are what you do today and how you got there it's a great place to start sure that's great thank you george i appreciate the uh the opportunity to share a little bit about our story, you know, here in Eatontown and, and what our journey, you know, certainly has uh, has been. So as you mentioned, you know, uh, Eatontown Public Schools, we're a smaller K-8 district here in uh, in New Jersey. Uh, we're one of probably 500 other districts uh, that make up New Jersey as well, which is a little bit different, you know, certainly state to state. Um, in terms of geography, we're located really near the, uh, the Jersey Shore here. Uh, we have about a, th a thousand students in our district. We're split among four different uh, schools. Our schools are organized, you know, basically we have a K-1 school. Uh, we have a uh, two, three, four, grades two, three, four school, a grades five, six school, and then a grade seven, eight school. And then after eighth grade, 
our students go to the uh, regional high school, you know, certainly, uh, you know, after that, mm -hmm. I think we're a pretty diverse uh, district, diverse economically, uh, diverse in terms of the uh, demographics, you know, certainly, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that has really kept our team, you know, here, I think, uh, together, because I think we're really engaged in the work because things are constantly, you know, changing here in our little school district. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to continue to adapt to, you know, the times and make sure we're providing the the tools and the resources and the access to education as our community, you know, continues uh, to change. My, uh, my journey has been, um, this is going to be my 25th year in uh, public education. The first four years, um, I started out as a uh, high school social studies teacher, really enjoyed teaching social studies and, and had a passion for it. Um, after that, I had gotten my administrative degree and wound up uh, taking a position in the same district, uh, wound up being an elementary assistant principal in a K-5 school. And then uh, from there, after about three years being assistant principal, I felt the need to kind of push the envelope a little more and become principal. I was principal in a district prior to the one that I'm in now for two years. And then I wound up uh, moving from there to Eatontown, where I am now. And um, I was a principal at one of the schools for about three and a half years. At the, uh, the middle of that three and a half year journey, the superintendent decided to uh, retire mid-year. The board kind of asked me, would I be willing to interview you know, for the position? I did. And then from there, they offered me a contract. And now 12 and a half years later, uh, here we are. Well, and how, how was that transition? Like, how was the transition when you were a principal in the district to go into superintendent? I know, and I know it's a smaller community, so probably, um, I, maybe this is not the best thing to say, but it's probably true. Probably some people are really excited because they knew you already. And probably some people weren't excited because they knew you already, <laughs> right? Like, right. It, right. Like some people are like, no, like we want, like, how was that transition through that process? So I would probably say from going back to at least from my experience anyway, looking at it from the transition from teacher to assistant principal, different, but I didn't think that I thought it was pretty smooth overall. Mm -hmm. I also thought that the transition from assistant principal to, uh, to principal, I thought that transition was pretty smooth, you know, as well. I will tell you, though, and I don't I, there's a couple things that I think account for the difference. But it's really, really an interesting question because from principal to superintendent, it was uh, night and day. And I mm -hmm. kind of think about just to use a, uh, a sports analogy. I remember one time they asked Peyton Manning. They said to him, you know, they said, Peyton, you know, you're such a, you know, all pro, you know, all star, you know, quarterback. You've won Super Bowls and, and things like that. What's the difference between when you started your career to where you are now as a seasoned quarterback? And I kind of equate this, at least in my journey, from principal to superintendent. And he said that when I first took the field as a, as a rookie quarterback, the game was so fast. He goes, I was having a hard time, you know, figuring out where the pass rush was coming in, mm -hmm. figuring out reading the plays. He goes, the, the, the receivers were, you know, running all around the field and it was hard to kind of target them. He goes, and then all of a sudden, after a couple of years, the game just kind of began to get a little bit slower. I began to see the field better. I understood the plays better. And then from there, I hit my rhythm. And for me, that's what it was like as superintendent. I think the first year or two, there were so many things that I had to learn and so many things coming at me. And then by the time I hit like that year two, three, things got a little better. By year five, I really felt like the game had really slowed down to where we are you know, today, where I feel like I, I have a better sense as to what the responsibilities are as superintendent. What I mean by that is, I took the, the the responsibility that I was an educational leader and that mm -hmm. was the most important thing. And it certainly is. But if you forget that you're also at, at a certain level of political leader, you can't right. get your educational things done without knowing that there's a political side to the job. And that's where I had to learn a lot along the way. That, that, you know, and that, I think that's a, an important aspect because um, if, if you don't address some of that stuff, if you don't address some of the political stuff, yeah, like you said, you're not going to have time um to to actually learn and to grow and things like that and you see you know you see a lot of people that um aren't aren't modeling their learning aren't sharing that stuff and i think it's sometimes they ha the, the the play hasn't slowed down for them and I, like i'm curious about this because 
you know, going back to the Peyton Manning, which I thought was a brilliant analogy and a great connection in, in, in kind of how you're looking at this. Peyton Manning was still sacked, you know, as he got older, you know, still threw interceptions, still did stuff. And I, I think about, especially the last few years, um, you know, as much as stuff may have to slow down for you, it doesn't mean that there's not issues or things like that. So like having some, you know, a lot of, there's, there's so many new superintendents in the last few years because so many superintendents are like, I'm out, like, I don't want, it. I'm done. Right. So having experience, you know, being there and, and actually being comfortable in the role. And then we're thrust into the last, you know, 2020 to now, how did you deal with that? And, and how do you felt, you know, your, your, maybe your staff dealt with you during that time when you're going through such a crazy transition that everyone was going through? Right. So one thing that I just want to connect back on, because I know the world, you know, when you hear things like politics, right, they, there's a certain emotionally charged, it's an emotionally charged world right. in the society that we live in right now. What? And when Is I, it? Is when, it? <laughs> when I use the word, you know, politics, I don't, I look at it more in terms of influence. I really don't care whether you're a Democrat, independent right. or Republican. My job as the superintendent is to influence, you know, the, the policymakers as best I can to make sure that we're getting what we need, you know, here in Eatontown. So I work with all parties, all people, right. because that's what the Board of Education hired me to do in order to, you know, to, to get things done. But to your point, I think, you know, it's one of those things where it's a it's a high risk, high reward, you know, environment. And I, I think you you really, George, hit that on the head is that even though I feel more comfortable in the job now, it doesn't mean that everything's perfect. It doesn't mean that I as I'm driving home my half hour ride home, I'm not replaying and reflecting <laughs> right. on the, uh, you know, on the day saying, you know, where could I have done things a little bit differently? You know, how could I support my team, you know, a little bit better, you know, certainly along the way. And um, I think the the more you want to push the envelope and do good things for kids, um, there's risk there. And you, sometimes you're going to have some missteps. But I think the difference is, is that I don't worry as much about the missteps when right. the missteps happen. I say, okay, why did it happen? How could we do things differently? And let's you know, dust ourselves off and let's try it again. Yeah. And th there's, you know, when you're, I'm going to go back to a couple of things that, that influence the, your, and this is me as a parent, your role is to influence stuff to ensure we get everything to help our kids. That's, that's the bottom line for me, right? Like that, that's what it is. And I think sometimes, when Paul and like I use that term politics, when the, when it goes astray in a district, it's sometimes more about the adult egos than serving the kids. That's when you're. That's when we get in trouble. That's when I've seen people get in trouble. It's more like, well, I think, and it's like, no, no, no. Let's talk about kids. What are we doing to help our kids? And I think I I, I really appreciate that you said that because I think that matters to me as a dad how important that actually is. I, I think you know. And I'm sure you're downplaying this quite a bit because I, I know you don't like taking credit for stuff, but you having that relationship with people and people knowing you, there's a trust when things go wrong that they know, as you said, you're, 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 even if you're going wrong, they know your heart's in the right place, that you're trying to do the right thing, that, you know, we all make mistakes in that process. But that matters. That, that relationship matters, and kind of being in a small community, um, that that really connects. And and I'm going to actually bring up something that happened when I was with your group. And this, I don't know if I should be saying this, but there's a there's a gentleman I'm going to ask you about, Jimmy. I I love Jimmy. Jimmy's my guy, right? One of the things I try to do really quickly is build rapport in a room, which is. Um, which is hard to do when you have a short amount of time with, with people, right? So I talk about my family and stuff like that. I want to make sure people know that my heart's in the right place. And the reason that it has to do with Jimmy is because I talked for a little bit and, and I won't like when I was talking, Jimmy said, and I, and I brought, I did bring up the, the Jimmy episode of Seinfeld. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, which is probably one of my favorite episodes or Jimmy talks about himself in the third person, which I kind of had to make that joke. But one of the things that he said, and I really, I was really impressed was he's like, I'm struggling with some of the stuff you're saying, but I also know that I need to like grow and get better. And that, 
that was like so impressive to me because I think a lot of times uh, we don't see our superintendents. We don't see people in that position talking about where they struggle and, and having some of that struggle and knowing that we can, no matter how much time experience we have, we can always get better and we need to be pushed. It, what what would you take on that? And I don't I know like he's he's awesome, right? This is no slander. And if anything, it's actually praise because I think we need more of that where people are like, nah, you know what? Like I I'm struggling here, but I gotta get better. Like I gotta grow. And I think we need more of that, more more of that in public, to be honest with you. Like people sharing the growing, because I think sometimes, again, going back to ego, we don't necessarily want to show we're wrong, but then we encourage kids to struggle with stuff and to you know, push their learning, but they don't necessarily see the adults doing that. So just, do you have a take on that? I was, I, I was curious. Cause I, I was like, a, one of my, I, I, that moment really stuck out to me. It was really quite impressive. Yeah. So I think a couple things there, you know, the first thing is, is great to him because, you know, I think one of the things that you probably got a sense is in that room, there's a lot of different personalities. There's a lot of levels of, of success. You know, there, there are superintendents that were in that room that, have been published, you know, they've gotten their doctorates from impressive, you know, institutions, they've done some really, really creative things, you know, in their districts, and good for him, because what probably you didn't know is that and it kind of gets back to what I was saying before, uh, Jimmy is a good example of a superintendent who's less than two years in. So right. I think when you were presenting, he was probably thinking about his first year, year and a half as superintendent. And there's probably certain things that were certainly, you know, resonating with him. And I thought it was great that he was comfortable in a group of, you know, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, you know, different superintendents in the room. He felt comfortable being vulnerable and yeah. kind of saying in front of us, hey, you know, I don't know how I feel, you know, about, um, you know, all those things. But I think part of it is, is that we all continue to grow in these leadership roles. And I think, you know, some of the things that we were talking about, he had a kind of do that public question for a minute. You know, I don't I don't know how I feel about that. Do that modeling thinking out loud. And I think he was hoping that you and the rest of the group, you know, might kind of offer some suggestions along the way. And that's really the work. You know, I think that no matter what, whether you're a teacher, I think, whether you're an assistant principal, principal, special education director, we all have to develop our networks because the job is bigger than all of us. And if we don't have those networks where we can bounce ideas off of one another, it really does limit our impact on the communities we serve. Well, like you said something, and I don't know if I totally agree with you. And what I mean by that is we all grow. I don't know if I agree with that. We all should grow. <laughs> that is important because not everyone does. And, and I'll right. actually give you a story. This is one of my this is one of my favorite stories. I don't know. I can't remember if I share this with you or not. I was uh I was speaking at a school district in Canada. Actually, I remember the exact school district. I remember sitting in the room and there is a principal there. He was incredible. One of the nicest guys ever, super outgoing. And he was like, I don't know about this. And, you know, like he was kind of like, we we're having great conversations. He's like, I don't, you know, I'm struggling with some of the stuff you're saying and things like this. And like, it wasn't confrontational at all, like nothing. And he was just an awesome guy. And I got a message about a week earlier there and from the person that said, do you remember that principal you're talking to? And they're like, yeah, he filed for retirement. Like basically after your session, like he's, and then, and then, and then a week later, cause he just decided like I'm out. And he said, and this always stuck with me. He said in his retirement, now I wasn't there. I'm getting the second hand. He said, you know, I was thinking about saying for a couple more years and then George came and I'm like, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I'm out. And the reason why I'm out is because I really think the stuff he's talking about is really important and we need to get better. We need to grow at. And I'm just at the point in my life. I don't want to, like, I just don't want to push myself anymore. I don't want to keep doing this stuff. And why I'm leaving is because it's not right for me to stay and not grow. And it's okay for me not want to grow. It's not okay for me not want to grow and stay. And I just, I thought that was so like it, like it was such a powerful lesson that he did because I, I'm a big advocate. If you are done learning, you should not teach. That's like, that's the end of it too. So that's, that's why it really stuck out to me. Like that just was really powerful how he said that. And I know we're, you know, and like I said, highest of praise for him doing that because some people would take that as like a negative that we're talking about it. Whereas I see this totally upside, totally upside that somebody wants to get better. 
Well, you know, and and that's an interesting an interesting story. And just connecting back to you know what you and I were mentioning a little yeah. while ago, I think the other part in leadership is that you have to develop, and this is where you hope that you continue to grow. Because I do agree with you, right? You know, unfortunately, not everyone will grow. And I think if right. if you get to that place where you're not willing to grow, that's when you got to make a decision, right? Your decision is right. going to be, it's going to be more of the same. And if it's not going in a, in a positive direction, you're going to continue to experience that if you're not going to grow. And I think the other, the other piece of it is, is that hopefully in part of that growth is that you become a little more self-aware. And yeah. I think that's to me where the, the, the learning really has to happen. I don't think that I'm the same person that I was right. five, 10 years ago. And if, you know, depending upon how long I'm, I'm doing this work, I probably won't be the same person another five to 10 years ago because, you know, situations change, your own self-awareness changes, the different, the, some of the things that you're able to tolerate today may be different than what you can tolerate tomorrow. And I mean, in a good thing, because mm -hmm. I think some of the things that come my way now, I can tell you probably six, seven years ago, <laughs> I would have been, okay, we're not going to do that. You know, who needs right, the headache right. for all that? Now it's like, right. you know what, the headache is part of the process. We just need to, you know, wow, for, wow. you know, move forward. So, hey, we, we, you know, I know we talked about this a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a hard time about it. Cause I'm like going to publicly call you out now. You talked about blogging, writing stuff, man, sitting here talking to you. If you don't start a blog, like right away after this, I'm going to, I'm going to be on your case, man. Like <laughs> that, that's part of it. And this is the reason I'm bringing this up. You said something really, you know, kind of growing back five, six years ago. So I have a blog I wrote, I think it was in 2011. I actually just posted, uh, I, I do a weekly email and I think I just actually wrote about this. And I talked about in 2011, I went and revisited that post and basically said, I agree with what I said in that post, totally disagree with my tone and how I came about. And to actually kind of see those snapshots of your learning was so powerful to me, but to actually go back and say, yeah, like this is not, I don't, I don't like this. And how, how I was in this post, everyone that agreed with me already was just going to cheer me on. And everyone that disagreed with me, I totally pushed them further away in, in the way I delivered that message. And I think it was, I think it's an important thing to be able to say like, Hey, here's what I used to do. And I always say this, my blog is sometimes I, you know, I, I get into, you know, a conversation with a teacher or an administrator. I'm like, ah, like, I can't believe they're doing that. And then I stop and I think, was I ever like that? And did I ever do the same thing? And then I like, okay, so now I'm going to write about when I was like that, just to give myself some perspective, because what, what did it take me to change my mind? And it, it's not to like make that person feel bad. It's to empathize and understand like, I, there's a lot of people wanted me to grow quicker in certain areas and I wasn't ready at that time. And so I think we need to look back. So, so when's this blog starting for you? I'm, I'm really curious about when we're, we're getting that out to the world. I think sooner rather than later, you know, it was certainly on the, uh, on the to-do list, but I right. think, uh, you know, after hearing you now, I think, you know, like I said, and Dude. that's something too, that will take time to kind of develop and you get better as you kind of do it. And I think the hardest thing in life, right, is getting started. And that's what you, you know, I think Dude, you really have to just start the process. Today's the day. Today's the day, man. You know, like, you know, you know, what be, here, I'll even, I'm doing some modeling for you right now. When this podcast comes out, take the podcast and then put it in your blog and write about, this is the start of my blog. Here's why I already, there, I just gave you your first blog post. There's your start, man. This is a, it, this is a good prompt to get started. I totally, totally agree. This I is think like that's uh, the uh, the way to go, and I, and I really, it, it's interesting because I think one of the things that I have to do better, and this is you know me being a little bit you know uh, yeah. you know vulnerable, is that I think you have to have confidence in your experience, you know, somewhere along the way, yeah. and I think you have to kind of just get yourself out there, and I think part of it is is that for some people your experience is going to connect with certain people, and sure. for others it's not. And that's okay. You know what I mean? That's, you know, every, you know, each person who experiences it, they got to figure out what to make of it on their own. And that's not for me to decide. It's you put the content out there and then people have to decide whether it's relevant to them or not. This is uh so this, I didn't tell you, this is a podcast slash blogging intervention. That's what this turned into real quick. <laughs>
Well, I hey. appreciate the uh, the coaching. <laughs> I really, really do. So, okay. So this is this is not just for you. This is for everyone listening that's like considering this. What has really helped me through this process? I don't write for anybody else other than myself. And I think part of it is I'm not, I never am brag. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just sharing my learning. That's all I'm doing. And I, I look at everything. And like you said, if it helps somebody along the way, great. But I guarantee, you know, it's like, if you could just reach one person, every time I write a blog post, it does reach one person, me. Because it's me sitting down, me focusing on sharing my learning and me really trying to put my thoughts together. And I'll tell you there, and I've said this a million times on this podcast, there is nothing better that I've ever done for my learning than to blog because it forces me to not only put my thoughts down, but knowing other people can see it makes me more cognizant of what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that's where that, that power comes in. So we're all looking, we're all looking, we're, everyone's here. We're all cheering you on. We're waiting for that first blog post now. And what I like about the idea of blogging too, is that it really forces you, you know, when you're writing, listen, people don't have time to read 20 pages. It yep. forces you to really be clear and concise with 100%. what you're putting out there and getting your message out as quickly as possible. So, because people don't have, you know, two hours to read your blog, right? Totally. I love it. Okay. So this is a, and maybe some people are listening to this right now. I know I'm this guy. Um, maybe some people are listening to this while they're running. I listen to podcasts while I run all the time. It's one of my, is, is where I get a ton of great information, do audible, that kind of thing. So when I got there, I remember you were wearing a suit, but you had some, some shoes on and you're getting a little hard time for some of the guys about, um, uh, your shoes. And you're like saying, yeah, like I, I gotta have, to, I gotta be ready for a run tomorrow and stuff like that. Um, how has running, um, like what does running do for you? What, like, why do you, why do you do it other than the health benefits? Is there a mental, uh, benefit of doing that for you? I know there is for me, but I, I'd love to hear your answer on that. Sure. So I, I think it's, it's multifaceted. I, I really do. So just in terms of my running journey, and I think a lot of us kind of probably experience these things along the way. So it was actually my wife. I was, I was 39 at the time. And my wife said, you know, I think, you know, we, you know, the, the kids are a little bit, you know, older now. I think we have to, you know, spend some time, you know, coming together. Running could be an activity that we can do together because she was an athlete, you know, back in the day. It could create a little bit of a family time. And it wouldn't be a bad thing either as we're getting older in age to yeah. just stay active and develop, you know, those uh, those routines. I got to tell you, I hated the idea. I wasn't, you know, I, I like sports and things like that, but the idea of just running, it seemed boring to me. And why would I want to, you know, why, why would I want to do this? Well, she got me involved in, in a couple five Ks and the first couple I wasn't so happy about, but maybe my third or fourth, I guess the competitive nature in me started yeah. getting going. And then all of a sudden I enjoyed the five Ks and I said, there's got to be a little bit more than the five K moved up to a five mile, you know, kind of run yeah. and then enjoyed that and said, well, what's next? Maybe a half marathon. And we did the half marathon training and we did a couple of those things, you know, together. And then yeah. finally, after the, the half marathon, I said, well, what's next? I didn't know if I was ready for the marathon or not, but down by the Jersey Shore in Long Beach Island, they have an 18 mile race, which most marathoners, I didn't know this at the time because I was still new to running. Uh, they use it as almost like a pre-qualifier for the uh, New Jersey, for the New York City, you know, marathon. Yeah. So you get a lot of runners there. So I did it. I did the 18 mile race and I said, you know what? That wasn't as bad as I thought. Let me get into the marathoning. And, you know, from there, uh, a year and a half ago, I finished my ninth, you know, marathon. And, you know, oh, really yeah. from 39, about 10 years, I'm, I'm 49 now. It's really, you know, just become over the last 10 years an evolution in terms of the running and the distances. And uh, it's become really a part of my life. And I think the health is part of it, but yeah. more than the actual physicality of it and the physical health it really helps me up here. It's the mental aspect of it because, you know, the jobs are, you know, they're very mentally demanding. And the idea that I can kind of, even on a, on a night, you know, just go out for an hour long run, maybe do five, six miles, seven miles, something like that. Um, I don't plug in. I just have my, uh, my Garmin watch, which I have on, you know, today. And uh, it's just, hitting the watch, hitting start, running for a while, and um, just letting thoughts kind of hit my, you know, my mind right. and c connecting back to the blogging during that run, that might be where I generate some ideas, you know, for the blogging right. as I'm running. 
that's you know what that's that's a little cycle you're not playing any music or anything to me i i i used to do that all the time and now i'm like could i just run and sometimes i'm like i don't want to i don't want to be just totally in my head because you know it get kind of dark there sometimes so you know that that's awesome man but hey this is gonna be you know you, you got some you got some titles that you can work with you know like blogging the running superintendent kind of some of that stuff so there you go all right so this is the last question i'm gonna ask you and uh, I know that you're very proud of your school district and you, you talk so glowingly about, you know, the people that you work with, your community, your kids, um, in all my conversations I've had with you. And I don't want to, I, like, I was, I was going to ask you about like how, what would be your message to them and to others, you know, that they could hear about, you know, kind of finishing off the year, right? This is being published in April. And so probably be a good time for that but actually i don't want that what are you most proud of for this school year of your school district i think what i'm most proud about is that after the last few years you know coming out of you know the pandemic and some of the other things that we've had to deal with is that i think as a district we're really embracing our equity journey right now and there's certainly let me be quite honest there's a lot more we have to do going along the path of that equity journey but it's really, really neat to see that at all levels of the organization, you know, from the, the administrators. And what I mean by that is, you know, our principal yeah. group and our director group, you know, to our, our teaching staff, to our power professionals. And I even see it here in, in central office and even with our transportation staff, our, our bus drivers and, and our bus aides, people are starting to, re they're, they're really understanding the idea of that equity journey and what we have to do differently as a district to really meet the changing needs of our community because the Eatontown in just the 15 years or so that I've been in, in Eatontown, when I started back in 2007 mm -hmm. to where we are in, in 2023 today, it's a very different community for a lot of different reasons. And if we continue to, to exercise the same get game plan that right. we did 15 years ago, we wouldn't be servicing the students, you know, that, that we need to, you know, to service. So I think that, in, a, in an industry where sometimes change can be really hard, it's really nice to see that we're all kind of, and again, there's more work to be done, but it's nice to see that everybody's kind of working together to figure out what's the next thing we have to do in order to, to help the students succeed. You know, when, when I, so I remember my very um, first year of teaching, I, I remember the teach. I know this is gonna sound weird, the teachers I really looked up to were the teachers that would come in two weeks early, they do all their photocopying for the year and they could tell you on October 3rd at 10 30 AM in math, this is where those kids will be. They're going to get whether they're going to get in there kicking or screaming. Right. And they're like, basically they could, they were so planned out. And then, you know, as I progressed in how I viewed education and how I viewed those opportunities, I'm like, how could you do that? If you've never met the kids, you don't know who's in your room. You don't know any of that stuff. The first thing we need to know is know the, the people you're serving. And I think that, you know, you, you said that beautifully because that, that, you know, that the thing that will always change in education are the people that we have in front of us every year, you know, even, you know, depending on what you teach could be like multiple times per day, you have to honor the people that you serve. And I think that um, is a great way to end the podcast and, and really kind of recognize Scott, everyone now is waiting for your, your blog to learn more about, um, your learning, your school district's uh, journey, and all the stuff that you're doing. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your super busy day um, to join me. Uh, it has been a pleasure to get to know you better. Yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity. It was really nice to have a conversation with you today about education, a little bit about uh, a life, and uh, I hope we can connect again one day. Can't wait, man. All right, everyone, thanks for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. Be well.